and Bob Harworth from Cornell University is one of the prominent and most well-known experts in the field of methane. And he's going to tell us why methane is being underestimated and what its power is in terms of climate change. Thank you, David. I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, it's a true honor to be with all of you who are in the front line of this fight. Uh, just delighted to be here. As Casey said, I, I, my, my charge is to give you some of the technical information on methane and why it's a bad problem for shale gas. Uh, and the context I want to give is, is coming out of the United Nations COP21 meetings in Paris last December. I know several of you were there, I was there. Uh, out of that, next slide. I was delighted to see that the nations of the world uh, took the science message seriously. They also listened to the people who live on uh, islands that are the most vulnerable of the world. And they set what we must consider a very aggressive target. We need to keep the planet well below 2 degrees Celsius, they said. And they recognized that 1.5 degrees Celsius above the long-term pre-industrial baseline is, is dangerous. That's right. That's what the scientists were saying. I was surprised they listened. But they agreed. They've set that target. So what does it mean? Next slide. I'm going to show you some data. This is an important slide. I'm going to show it to you twice, so bear with me a little bit. This is a paper published in 2012 giving model estimates of, of the future of the planet. It shows the Earth's warming over the 20th century up to 2011. We've been warming more quickly in recent decades. And then it gives us a few scenarios into the future. The one I want you to look at at the moment is the green line. And that is what would happen if we don't do anything to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And what it tells you is that we'll reach the target of 1.5 degrees in about 13 years from now. And we'll reach 2 degrees in about 28 years from now. So we need, the nation to agree, we need to keep the planet well below 2 degrees Celsius. That means we're talking about actions over the next decade or two. We're not talking about some long off the planet. Next slide. What this shows is that the model I just showed you, published back in 2012, is already out of date. This is a really nice visualization. What it's showing is that starting back in 1850 in the center and going around the seasons of the year, global average temperature has been rising, and it's been rising particularly in the last few decades, and it's been rising particularly uh, recently. Last year was the warmest year ever on record. This year is going to surpass that. Uh, last month was the warmest month ever on record. The one before that was the warmest on record, and then so on. It's, it's, like, it's, it's scary, quite frankly. And we are coming very close to the 1.5 degree target right now. We may well surpass it within the next year or so, not 12 years up. So we need to take some dramatic action. Next slide. Okay. Why are we worried in particular about 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius? And the reason is that as we hit those temperatures, we run a much higher risk of fundamentally changing the global carbon system in a way that humans at that point cannot really alter by reducing our emissions. We need to reduce the emissions first so we don't take that risk. And I could go on, I'm a professor, I teach a course on this, I could go on for 20 hours talking about what those thresholds in the climate system are. Told me I've got 15 minutes. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you two examples. One example is that of the carbon dioxide that we put in the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels over the last uh, century, half of that has been taken up by the oceans or taken up by the terrestrial biosphere of the Earth. And that has helped save us and helped mitigate the worst aspects of climate change. That may be changing, and there's evidence it may be changing already. And what this shows you on the upper left is that the Global carbon dioxide emissions of the planet have in fact stabilized over the last couple of years. We are no longer increasing our CO2 emissions. That's good news. But on the right are the actual data on atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. And those are going up at the most rapid rate ever now, even though we are no longer increasing our emissions. And the best interpretation of that is that the oceans and terrestrial biosphere are no longer helping us out in the way they used to. And there are a variety of reasons we would expect that to happen as the planet warms. It may already be happening. Next slide. One other thing I'd like to concentrate on is methane class rates that form a sort of frozen methane on the continental shelves of the world's oceans. There's massive amounts of methane there that froze out over the last uh, ice age. It's still there. 
Jim Hansen, looking at the geological past, has warned us that as the Earth reaches 1.8 degrees, we run a high risk of that melting, a high risk of it going into the atmosphere, and if so, it will completely overwhelm anything that society has done so far as greenhouse gases. So we want to keep the planet well below 2 degrees Celsius. Next slide. A little technical thing here, but you guys are activists, and I want you to know this so that when you go out and talk to people, you understand the difference between the two major gases. Global warming is almost entirely due to carbon dioxide and methane. Other gases are small in proportion. Carbon dioxide and methane are both important. They're both carbon gases, but they're very different. Carbon dioxide, when we put it into the atmosphere, will have an influence that lasts for hundreds of years into the future because it's taken up by the oceans to some extent in the forest, it's re equilibrating, and that on for a long, long time. Because of those lags of interaction with the oceans and forests, anything we do to reduce carbon dioxide emissions now won't have an immediate influence. It will actually take about 30 to 40 years to see a demonstrable slowing in the rate of warming if we reduce CO2 emissions. Methane is fundamentally a different gas. It's only in the atmosphere for about 12 years, and that's gone. It's converted to carbon dioxide, but it's gone as methane. We don't need to worry about it as a long-term gas unless we hit fundamental thresholds in the climate system because of warming from methane and meanwhile, we may well be doing it. And it's fundamentally different from carbon dioxide in that if we reduce methane emissions now, we slow the rate of global warming now. Let we'll me say that again. We reduce methane emissions now, and we slow the rate of global warming now. And that is the only pathway we have as a planet to reach the target set in Paris by 2021. Next slide. I'll show you the detail of that in a minute, but this is out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the last synthesis a few years ago. We're comparing global emissions from carbon dioxide and methane from human activities here using their data. The time frame of comparison matters. I think the short time period is important. We'll talk about that more later, but we're serious about climatic warming in the next decade or so. The short term is what we need to look at. But at this short time period, the left hand is important. The orange and the global CO2 emissions, red is methane. The methane emissions equal or exceed the carbon dioxide emissions at the moment globally. This is an important guess. Next slide. All right, this slide. I told you the green is the reference. If we do nothing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we're probably warming the planet faster than the study would have indicated a few years ago. What are the other scenarios there? The next one down that says CO2 measures is what happens if society had started back in 2012 to aggressively reduce CO2 emissions, which of course we didn't do. What would happen? Well, nothing for the first few decades because of these labs. It would be a long time into the future before it had any influence, and we're going to blow right through the top 21 target if we concentrate only on CO2. The bottom two ones there are what happens if we start to reduce methane emissions, either alone or with carbon dioxide. And the bottom line is, again, we immediately start to slow the planet warming if we concentrate on methane. It is the only way to keep the planet well below 2 degrees Celsius over the next several decades. Next slide. Okay, well that, that brings us to shale gas, to natural gas, this idea that natural gas is a bridge fuel that can somehow be a reasonable part of the, of the uh, clean action plan or not. But the basis of it, the science basis, is that natural gas is an energy rich fuel and when we burn it, it produces less carbon dioxide to get the same amount of energy compared to either coal or oil. That's absolutely true. That does not make it a good bridge fuel. Next slide. Uh, Tony and Graffia and I and others from Cornell took on as a research channel, now going back five, six, seven years ago, the role of methane in natural gas use and development, and particularly looking at shale gas. And we published the first ever analysis on this, no one obtained it, uh, just five years ago. And I won't go into detail here other than to tell you that natural gas is mostly methane. And when you develop and use natural gas, it's not all burned. Some of it leaks to the atmosphere. Gases are slippery things that are hard to contain. So some of it goes to the atmosphere, and it's more than 100 fold more powerful than carbon dioxide when it's in the atmosphere. So small leaks matter. You said that. Next slide. One of the things we said is that the evidence at the time wasn't great because people hadn't paid a lot of attention. The shale gas revolution was new when we published our paper in 2011, right now. Little arrow and light pointing to where our paper came up. 
Shale gas is becoming an increasingly important part of the natural gas store in the United States as conventional natural gas runs out. And we hypothesized, and we have some data suggesting that methane emissions were worse than shale gas and from conventional natural gas, making it a worse deal of terrible region. Next slide. But one of our conclusions was that this was scary business, but the quality of the data out there was very limited, poor, and we needed more scientists to go into the field and work free of the influence of, of the natural gas industry and get objective data. We said that five years ago, or two months ago, five, five years or two months ago, I'm very pleased, really pleased to tell you that a lot of scientific colleagues globally took us up on that challenge and they've done so, and we know a huge amount more now than we did even three years ago. Next slide. And I'm just going to very quickly show you two papers that have come out in the last couple of years. This is one on the co-author on. We took an airplane and flew it over southwestern Pennsylvania, tried to look at emissions from uh, fracking operations. The airplanes are quick to measure methane in real time. You can see there on the left figure is that the airplane flies back and forth to identify the well on the ground, and methane levels go up and down. We can map a plume of methane rising from this rig. And in this case, this is a rig that's being built in the Marcellus Shale, but then yet hit the shale. And yet, emitting massive amounts of methane, which we didn't expect, no one else expected, the EPA still fails to recognize as even an issue. Next slide. This study is the more important one. It's probably the most important study that's come out. It was published a little bit less than two years ago, using satellite data from 2003 to 2012, when this satellite went out of commission, so we did not get data like this after 2012. But what it shows on the upper right there, go up and down there, that's the sign of latitude. So zero means the equator, the one is the North Pole, the minus one is the South Pole, and we're looking at the average of the circumference of the latitude over time. Red means that the methane concentrations are going up, and what you see is that the methane concentration globally increased substantially over this time. Then the lower left, they're looking in detail across the United States at the period of 2006 to 8, which is before the shale gas revolution. 2009 and 11, which is after it, the conclusion of this study is that the global increase in methane in the last decade is almost entirely attributable to shale gas and shale oil development in the United States. That's a globally important phenomenon. It's part of the reason it's hot up here today, quite frankly. It's methane emissions from the United States, from shale gas and shale oil. That's right. Guardian got this right, I guess, the U.S. is the cause of the methane. Next slide. Just a little bit more science, I promise, and I'll be quiet, but I want, I want you to see a little bit of the details because industry does a massive effort to try to mischaracterize and confuse the science on this. So what I'm showing you here are all of the new studies as of uh, about nine months ago, plotted as a percentage of the methane emissions from the time a well is drilled until the gas is delivered to final consumer. Euro up to about 15 percent there. The light blue studies are all pretty good studies. I could go into an hour or so telling you why they vary, but I won't. The two arrows there, one is pointing towards the light blue, that's the airplane study I just showed you. The darker blue is the satellite data, which I think are the most robust data out there. There are some other data out there. Our initial estimate from our paper five years ago is the mean at the top. We were conservative, things are a lot worse than we thought. Next to down, what EPA said right after our paper came out, they sort of agreed with us, and they got industry pressure and pushed back and cut it in half, and that's what they've been saying recently. Next slide. EPA is dramatically <coughs> underestimating what's going on. I want to show you part of the reason why. Next slide. That's the EPA number that's currently in use, and the other paper there, paper by David Allen and all. David Allen's a professor at the University of Texas. Uh, this paper came out as chair of the Science Advisory Board for the U.S. EPA. That's the lowest number in there. It's part of the reason EPA was arguing that methane emissions are low. This paper is fundamentally flawed. Next slide. And the person who came forward and demonstrated this convincingly is an engineer named Touche Howard. Brave individual, perseverant, and smart as hell. Touche holds the patent on the instrument that was used in the Allen and Well study only instrument that's approved by US EPA for measuring methane. He makes money when they use the instrument. And he said, 
this instrument of dangerous is being misused and miscalibrated, the numbers are low by three to five to tenfold or more. We tried to tell EPA that, we tried to tell Alan that, we tried to work with the Environmental Defense Fund message that, we didn't get very far, so we published it in the open period of literature, it's been covered in the Guardian, the Washington Post now. It's also uh, been a formal complaint to the whistleblower, and some Warren has filed a complaint from the EPA. EPA and Allen tried to cover this up. They knew the side for that. And they covered it up by pretending that they were broken. Next slide. This is not the problem, but I have to show you this just because I think it's funny as hell. You see Howard pointed this out to me. This is a slide off of David Allen's website at the University of Texas where they're bragging about how careful their work is. And take a look at that lower left corner there. I'm going to blow this up for you. That's, that's a blow up of this. This is not the instrument in question that TJ is questioning, but it's an additional problem. In order to get the flux estimates right, you need to know the gas flow rates. This is the flow meter they're using. And someone thought it was important enough to keep this thing upright and level, but they actually wrote it on the instrument. But the field technicians, this is off their website, they took the photograph to show how careful they are. Next slide. So, I think the satellite data is the best data out there. Very hard to come up with any other explanation. They integrate in space and time, they JV increasing methane, it's coming through shale gas, and sure look. Next slide. So, what does that mean? I just have two more slides on the depth of the science. What I've looked at here, we published this last fall, is the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas, conventional natural gas, oil, and coal. When we look both at carbon dioxide, the emissions from what's burned, that's an orange, and then include the methane from the unburned heat each of these fuels, and they all have leakages. Uh, but for shale gas, it's using the satellite data there, and we're converting these to carbon dioxide equivalents using the approach of the... Sorry, can you hear now? We're converting the methane to carbon dioxide emissions using the protocol from the IPCC in 2013 and using the 20-year blah, blah, blah. Shale gas is a disastrous fuel, much worse than coal, you know, which is not a reason to use coal, it's a reason to get rid of them all. Next slide. Okay, one more thing I want you to go home with. Looking here from 1980 to 2014 at the greenhouse gas emissions of the entire United States from using fossil fuels. And the bottom line of the carbon dioxide emissions, they went up until the Great Recession of 2007, and then they've been going down since, partly because we're still in economic recession, and partly because we've switched from coal to natural gas and CO2 emissions go down. The next line, just above that, that exactly parallels it, is the official EPA story using their estimates for methane, which are wrong, and using an inappropriate time scale to compare with carbon dioxide, which is also wrong, and it makes methane look trivial. And the red line is what I think the true story is. The true greenhouse gas emissions from the United States, natural gas and methane, but the methane normalized in an appropriate way to carbon dioxide and, and acknowledging the switch of increased emissions that would use more and more shale gas. And what we see is the emissions went up for a while. The recession of 2007 is still apparent, but as of 2008, greenhouse gas emissions in this country have been going up at their most rapid rate ever. My next slide. My last slide. I think the science on Paris is really clear. The nations of the world want to keep the planet well below 2 degrees Celsius. The only way to do that is concentrating on methane. Shale gas is a disaster in that regard, and we need to ban it. We need to keep all fossil fuels on the ground. Certainly coal, but shale gas is even worse if we're serious about meeting this, this Prop 21 target. And if you're interested in follow-up on that, the powerslab.org there will take you to our website where we have smartphone-friendly one-page handouts on everything I've just said.